Today we're going to talk about the concept of compatibility, which is the property of a system um, where multiple pieces of information can be known or well-defined simultaneously. In order to illustrate this, let's first take an example from classical mechanics. Let's talk about a ball that is rolling or sliding or otherwise moving through space. We can characterize the state of this ball through lots of different pieces of information. We can talk about its size. We can talk about its color. We can, uh, we can uh, establish its position, its velocity, its acceleration. Each of these things can be done not just along an x-axis, but also a y and a z-axis. We can also describe how the ball is spinning around each of these three axes. And we can know each of these things simultaneously. In other words, it is possible to know where the ball is and how fast it's spinning and how fast it's moving and how fast in what direction it's accelerating. All of these things can be known at the same time as each other and knowing one of them doesn't affect our ability to know the other. Now, in order to really emphasize the fact that this is independent of human knowledge, a better way of phrasing this is that all of these variables are simultaneously well-defined. It makes sense to talk about the position and the velocity. It makes sense to talk about its uh, angular momentum around the x direction and the y direction. This is what it means to be compatible variables. The concept of compatibility is a rather new one. It's only about 100 years old, and that's because in classical physics, all variables are inherently compatible with each other. But we've already seen that that's not always the case in quantum mechanics, even just with spin itself. If I have a state that is just z plus, it has a well-defined angular momentum in the z direction, plus h bar over two. But if I were to perform a measurement of the spin of that state in the x direction, Sometimes I would get plus h bar over 2, and other times I would get minus h bar over 2. It is unclear what I should say the angular momentum in the x direction of this state is. Its angular momentum in the z direction is well defined. It has a specific value. But in the x direction, it doesn't have a specific value. There are two values that it could have, and there's no way of knowing what you'll get when you measure it until you actually measure it. Moreover, once I measure it, let's say I get plus h bar over 2, the state is no longer the same state as it was before. Now, it's a state that looks something like plus x, or x plus, I should say. And an x plus state no longer has a well-defined value of spin in the z direction, even though it now does in the x direction. If we talk about this in terms of like our ability to know something about, of a, about a system, it means I cannot simultaneously know the spin of a state or of a system in the x and in the y or z directions. I can only know the spin precisely as a well-defined value in one of those at a time. And if I perform a measurement to find out what the spin is in one of those other directions, I haven't cheated. I don't now know the spin in both of the uh, original z and now the x direction. Instead, I know what the spin is. The spin is now well defined in the new direction along which I've measured it at the cost of losing its well defined uh, behavior in the z direction. Because now if I were to go back and measure the spin in the z direction, sometimes I would get plus h bar over 2 again, but other times I would get minus h bar over 2. At this point, I want to clarify, and I've mentioned this before, but I want to clarify again what I mean when I say the word measurement. Measurement in the context of quantum mechanics does not imply the involvement of a conscious observer of any kind. It doesn't mean that there's some scientist in a lab coat looking through a microscope or something. Measurement is a word that basically is a stand-in for an interaction between the system that we're talking about and some external influence. Um, if there is an electron bumbling through empty space and it knocks into an atom that was floating around, that interaction between the two constitutes a measurement on the system of the electron. And the electron is basically doing a measurement on the atom. So measurement here um, really means the interaction between two quantum mechanical systems. Now, it's really a little bit more complex than this. In fact, there's a never-ending and raging debate about what measurement really means and what constitutes a measurement in quantum mechanics. 
And different interpretations of quantum mechanics have different answers and different hypotheses or suggestions for what we should mean when we say measurement. Um, but that's a good enough uh, rule of thumb for now. Measurement means interaction. I don't want you to end up with the misconception that what we're talking about here is somehow unique to the involvement of humans or other conscious observers into the process. Humans can measure things because we can interact with things just like grass and rocks and sunlight can interact with things. And so sunlight can perform a measurement on a quantum state just like you and I could. So what I wanna talk about now is how can we actually determine which properties in quantum mechanics are compatible with each other and which ones aren't. It turns out we can use the measurement operators corresponding to the different possible properties of a system to determine uh, which variables can be simultaneously well-defined. So let's consider, let's assume that there are two properties A and B that are compatible with each other, which means A and B can both be well-defined at the same time we can know the precise value of each of them for a particular state um, without affecting the other. If that's the case, then I should be able to measure property A and then measure property B. And I should get the same result as if I first measured property B and then measured property A. That's what it means to be simultaneously well-defined. It means I can measure both of them and no matter the order in which I measure them, I should end up with the same result. We can reuse the associative property to rewrite this first as the product of the operators and then act that product onto the state on each side. And then we can rearrange this equation to end up with the operator A times B minus B times A should be equal to zero. All this last line is telling us is that if A and B are compatible properties of a system, then their operators have to commute with each other that AB is equal to BA. The order in which we multiply these matrices does not affect the outcome. If you look back at the very first linear operator homework assignment I gave you, one of the things that I had you prove was that if a function f of x is a simultaneously an eigenfunction of two operators A and B, then the operations A and B commute with each other. The order in which we apply them doesn't affect the final outcome. We can prove the corollary using the same logic and show that if two operators commute with each other, they have the same eigenstates as each other, or the eigenfunctions as each other. This actually goes a long way to explaining uh, why uh, compatible variables have measurement operators that commute with each other. Because if you think about, for example, the spin operator SZ, the SC operator has eigen, eigenstates, Z plus and Z minus. And if you apply SZ to either one of those eigenstates, the outcome is the corresponding eigenvalue, a number, times the original state. Nothing has really changed. All that's happened is we've output the eigenvalue. We've output, out, out, we've output the sort of measured value um, of that system. If there's another operator that has the same eigenstate as SZ, then when I apply that operation after I've already measured SZ, all I'm gonna do is extract the eigenvalue of the second measurement because I'm left with basically the same state that I had before, except to have an extra H bar over two floating around telling me the value of spin in the Z direction. And now the second operation is simply going to give me the corresponding measurement or eigenvalue of the state according to the second um, operation. And so when you have two commuting operators, the variables that they correspond to are compatible with each other because we can simultaneously determine both of them. A measurement of one doesn't disrupt the state um, in such a way that it affects the measurement of the other. This gives us a really simple test for compatibility. If two operators commute with each other, then they are compatible with each other. And so we do this typically by writing it down as what we call a commutation relation. What we do is we take the product of two operators A times B, we subtract the product B times A, and that's equal to whatever it's equal to. And if 
this relationship is equal to zero, then A and B commute, and therefore they are compatible with each other. This concept is ubiquitous in quantum mechanics, and it's really fundamental to the idea of it. Um, and so in order to simplify uh, this expression, we often uh, simplify the left-hand side with what we call a commutator. And all we do is we write it as square brackets, and inside we put A comma B. And all this means is the commutator of A and B is simply A times B minus B times A. If you want to test whether two variables are compatible with each other, whether they can both be well-defined simultaneously, um, all you need to do is calculate the commutator of their operators, and if it's zero, they are compatible, and if it's not, they're incompatible. The whole introduction of this thing called a commutator might seem a little bit excessive, right? You might say, well, why don't I just write it like this? Why do I need this extra new fancy thing? Um, turns out commutators are really useful, and we can use commutators to calculate all kinds of things, one of which we'll get to in just a few minutes. Um, so bear with me on that. The commutator uh, makes our notation just a lot simpler, a lot less messy. But first, let's do an example. In particular, let's consider the example of the commutator of the operator Sx with the operator Sy. Now you should already recognize that this commutator should not be equal to zero because Sx and Sy don't represent compatible variables. Right? We cannot have well-defined spin in the x and in the y direction simultaneously. It's, a, it's one or the other. We know it. We either know Sx or we know Sy, um, or neither, but never both. So let's just verify that the math actually checks out. So we start with the product of Sx times Sy minus Sy times Sx. Then we can substitute in the matrix forms of these operators. We can carry out the matrix multiplication. Then we can combine the two terms, and then we can uh, factor and do a little bit of simplification. And we end up with a matrix that should look familiar. And with just a very little bit more rearrangement, we can actually write this as i times h bar times the sz operator. Note that we have the commutator of sx with sy is proportional to sz. Well, that's kind of a curious order, right? X, Y, Z. One thing you can note is if the, commu the commutator of A with B is always equal to the negative of the commutator of B with A, because all you're doing is you're reversing the order in which your terms show up. Um, if the commutator is zero, it doesn't matter. If it's not zero, you'll end up with a negative result. So if I wrote down the commutator of SY with SX, I would have ended up with a negative sign here. I would have had negative i h bar s z. And for those of you who are familiar with the cross product, um, this is similar. And in fact, it arises for essentially the same reasons. Um, and we have this nice pattern show up where the, where the commutator of s x with s y is s z. And we can also continue the pattern. The commutator of s y with s z is equal to i h bar s x. And the commutator of s z with s x is equal to i h bar um, times s y. Um, you'll prove those two uh, in your homework assignment. So if the commutator of two operators is zero, then they represent commuting variables. But if they're not equal to zero, like the examples we have over here, what does that mean? What is the result? What does the value of the commutator actually mean? Now note that the result of the commutator gives us an operator itself. But what does it actually mean? Well, it turns out that one of the other really important things, really useful things that we can do with commutators is we can use them to relate the uncertainty um, in two incompatible variables to each other. And we call these uh, relationships the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Unfortunately, a derivation of this result is actually quite uh, complicated. Um, so we're not going to do that. I'm just going to write down what the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is. Um, it tells us that the uncertainty in a variable A times the uncertainty in a variable B must always be greater than or equal to one-half times the magnitude of the expectation value of the commutator of A and B. It's a bit of a mouthful.
So let's do this for the example we just did above for Sx and Sy. This tells us that the product of the uncertainties in measurements of spin in the x and in the y directions is greater than or equal to one half times the magnitude of the expectation value of their commutator. Their commutator is simply i h bar times the s z operator. Now, i and h bar are just numbers, so we can pull those out of the expectation value. And then when we take the magnitude, the i goes away, and we're left with h bar over 2 times the, the magnitude of the expectation value of the s z operator. We can't go any farther than this without more information because the expectation value of the SE operator depends on the state. And so in this particular example, the product of the uncertainties of, of SX and SY depends on the particular state in question. As an example, let's consider the state Z plus. The expectation value of SZ of the state Z plus is simply H bar over two because we'll always get plus h bar over 2 in that particular case. Um, and uh, also recall from your previous homework assignment that the uncertainty of Sz of the state z plus is 0, because um, the variance is 0. So delta Sz is 0, but if we plug in h bar over 2 for the expectation value of Sz, we end up with delta Sx times delta Sy must be greater than equal, greater than or equal to the square of h bar over 2. Now, that implies that delta Sx and delta Sy both have to be greater than 0, or non-zero, um, because if either one of them were 0, then the product would be 0. And so if there is 0 uncertainty in the spin in the z direction, then there is some minimum uncertainty in the other two directions. Now, it's interesting because either one of Sx or Sy can be small, but not zero. But if one of them is very small, the other one has to be very large to make up for it because they have to be greater than or equal to this minimum amount um, of h bar over 2 quantity squared. If we instead picked an initial state, not z plus, but a state where the expectation value of Se were equal to zero, then the uncertainty principle for Sx and Sy would give us zero on the right-hand side, in which case delta Sx times delta Sy could actually be equal to zero, which means one of them could be equal to zero. It might be tempting to think that both of them could be equal to zero, and it would indeed satisfy this particular relationship, but there are actually three uncertainty principles involving our spin because there are three different pairs of spin. We can compute delta Sx with, uh, we can compute the uncertainty principle for Sx and Sy, for Sx and Sz, and also for Sy and Sz. And between those three relations, we'll only really ever need two of them to show this, it is only ever possible for one of these uncertainties to be equal to zero. If one of them is equal to zero, the other two must be non-zero. One of them can be very small in exchange for the other being very large, um, or they can both be large. And remember that this is a minimum. This is a greater than or equal to. So this uncertainty principle implies that this is a theoretical minimum of the uncertainty. It doesn't mean that the uncertainty couldn't in fact be even higher. This is really powerful because it allows us to talk about scenarios where things aren't quite perfect. For example, it is possible to have an ex a, sta a state where none of the uncertainties of any of the spin operators are zero. They're all some non-zero number. And what it tells us is that the smaller the uncertainty in one of the values of spin, the bigger uh, the others have to be, generally speaking. Um, so if you want to measure the spin in the x direction very, 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 very precisely, um, or if you, if you want to construct a state with a very, very, very well-defined value of spin in the z direction, it comes at the cost of requiring even greater uncertainty in one or both of the other directions. So there's a cost to precise measurements in quantum mechanics, which is um, a corresponding reduction in the precision uh, of the corresponding incompatible variables. So 
in classical mechanics, there's nothing stopping me from measuring the angular momentum of a system in all three directions in space. But in quantum mechanics, that's not so anymore. If I had a quantum mechanical top or ball and I threw it in the air, if I threw it in the air such that it was, and I, and I measured its spin very, very precisely around one of its axes, it means that the amount of angular momentum around the other axes are no longer well defined. And the more precisely I made my measurement to spin around the first axis, the less well defined the angular momenta around the other axes will be. Um, there will be some inherent uncertainty in the system as a result of the precision of my, uh, my measurement um, uh, on one of, these, of one of these variables. There is nothing quite like this in classical mechanics. Um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is uh, a very popular um, concept to introduce people to quantum mechanics with. Um, and it does, in fact, extend beyond just these spin operators. It, it extends to any operation, any observable quantity of any system you can think of. And so, for example, you may be aware of the uncertainty principle in the context of momentum and position. And that is, in fact, true. Uh, the product of uncertainty of momentum with the uncertainty of uh, position also satisfies a similar relationship. And in fact, that relationship is given by this exact formula, except this time with the position and momentum operators, which we'll talk about later on. Um, and that implies, for example, that the more precisely the position of a particle is uh, known or established, then the less precise its momentum is defined. So if you manage to confine a particle into a very small region, it means there is that its momentum is very poorly defined. And when you measure its momentum, you could find a huge range of values. On the other hand, if you have a particle and you measure its momentum very, very precisely, so you know almost exactly how fast it's moving, it means you don't know where it is. Not because you've lost it, but because it doesn't know where it is. Its position is poorly defined. It doesn't have a well-defined position. It is represented at that point by a wave function, a probability wave uh, that is spread out through space. And its, fun its position will no longer be well-defined until it is interacted with in some capacity that forces the uncertainty in its position to shrink again at the cost of the uncertainty of its momentum going back up. We're going to stop this here, and next time we will expand on this a little bit more um, with a wider range of operators, because right now we only really have the three operators, S, X, X, Y, and S, Z. And this becomes a little bit more interesting once we introduce a few more that we can play around with. See you next time.